In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you without word and deed, by all we have done, and by all we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the responsive singing of the psalm as printed in your bulletin. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. 
You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. The angry men do not sin. I will Offer right sacrifice, and put your trust in the Lord. have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. sacrifice and put your trust in the Lord. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Once more, the hymn of praise is omitted during Lent, and we continue with the salutation and collect on page 172. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Jeremiah in the 26th chapter. Now it happened when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people seized him, saying, You will surely die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. And the priests and the prophets spoke to the princes and all the people, saying, This man deserves to die, for he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the princes and all the people, saying, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city with all the words that you've heard. 
Now therefore amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent concerning the doom that he has pronounced against you. As for me, here I am in your hand. Do with me as seems good and proper to you. But know for certain that if you put me to death, you will surely bring innocent blood on yourselves, on this city, and on its inhabitants. For truly the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is from Philippians, the third chapter. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. On that very day, some Pharisees came, saying to him, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house has left you desolate, and assuredly I say to you, You shall not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the gospel of our Lord.
Grace and peace be to you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our text is from the 32nd verse of our reading in Luke. And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Your fellow redeemed. There's an old saying that goes, The more things change, the more they stay the same. I think it's especially true of where we find ourselves these days in the world. We live in an era of growing hostility towards Christ and Christianity. I mean, people hate Christian teaching very openly and very publicly. And it really wasn't that way 20 years ago. In fact, 20 years before that, when I was a teenager, Christian morality and Basic truth seems to have been accepted by society, but we've turned as a nation. The whole world seems to have turned and become much more openly anti-Christian. And yet the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because being hated has always been part of the life of the redeemed. Look at Jeremiah in the Old Testament reading. Way back then, he was hated. God sent him to speak against the sins of the people, to call out their unbelief and their opposition to God. Because God wanted these people to turn away from their sin so he could restore them to him in grace and give them everything he wanted to give them. But they dug in their heels, they doubled down on their godlessness, and they grabbed Jeremiah to kill him. They hated him. Then in the Gospel reading... Jesus was hated. He was warned by the Pharisees that Herod wanted to kill him because Herod hated him so much. Herod was the governing political authority in the region of Galilee. Herod thought of himself as a pretty important guy, a pretty powerful leader, even almost a king. In reality, he was just a Roman pawn, a low-level Roman governor of an insignificant Roman territory. Well, Herod hated Jesus. Because Jesus was so popular with the common people, the common people were actually talking about having Jesus as their king, and the last thing Herod wanted was somebody to challenge his authority. So, Jesus had to go. When Jesus learned of the plot against him by Herod, Jesus' answer was our sermon text today. Go tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. You know, first off, Jesus calls Herod a fox. That is not a compliment. We think of foxes as being cunning and smart and even beautiful. If somebody calls you a fox, that is a compliment. But the Jews didn't think about foxes like that. To the Jews, a fox was a lesser animal, cowardly, timid. There are several examples in Jewish writing, in fact, of them using a fox as the opposite of a lion. A lion was proud and magnificent, a kingly figure. So you see writings like, yeah, you thought you were a lion, but in reality you're a fox. So a fox means someone who's the opposite of grand and powerful. It means somebody who might think of himself as pretty great, but somebody ultimately who's a poser, a pretender, a small fry. So that was a label that would have infuriated Herod all the more against Jesus. But Jesus responded to all this hatred by not showing any fear. Jesus knew what Herod could do to him. In fact, what Herod would do stir up the people against him to ultimately kill Jesus. But Jesus did not give in to fear, even in the face of death. And neither did Jeremiah in the Old Testament reading, even though he was facing public execution. They both pressed on without changing a word. They walked right into the teeth of God's enemies and kept speaking that word clearly. They condemned the evil in the world that was robbing people of eternal life. And they pointed clearly to Jesus, God's Son, as the answer to sin. 
the one who would pay the price for that sin and redeem the world. So Jesus' answer was, you go tell Herod that I'm going to be about my normal work today and tomorrow, and then the third day I'm going to be perfected. That is a clear reference to his resurrection on the third day. Fear had no place in Jesus because Jesus knew he was about to overcome the world and everything that people fear in it. Even though the path in front of Jesus was filled with pain and heartbreak and a lot of suffering, he still looked past it all to the ultimate victory over evil that he was going to win for himself and for the world. And evil did its worst. It spent everything it had trying to destroy Jesus. And it couldn't. All it succeeded in doing was giving Jesus that very victory that he said he would win. It put him to death so he could rise from the dead. He rose in perfection from the dead. Above all that hate that had been aimed at him, He showed that not even death was the threat that evil made it out to be. Rising from the dead was no more traumatic for him than simply waking up from a nap. Nothing could harm him anymore. No petty political leaders could force their corrupt will on him. No immoral ideologies could threaten to take away his happiness in his life. He lived above this world and everything people are afraid of in it. That, my friends, is what Jesus gives to you today. It's what he gives to you in the face of all this world's evil that threatens you. Each time your Savior meets you here in his church and speaks his words of forgiveness and life over you, He is giving you a share of his resurrection, giving you his victory over all the world's evil and wickedness. So we can go our way, not being afraid of this world, knowing that we have victory over everything around us too. And that victory is safe in Jesus and the world can't take it away from us because it's rooted in him a work he's already accomplished. For the past few generations in this country, I think Christians have lived in a bubble, largely isolated from the world and its hatred. I mean, it has not been nearly as stressful to be a Christian in past times like we talked about before. But now I think that bubble is bursting and now we have to face the world's normal face. We have to get ready to suffer for what we believe and not give in to fear when we're threatened with anger and hostility. God's victory over everything that comes at us is already won in Jesus. And Jesus gives you that victory in no uncertain terms. You will rise from the grave just like he did. You will live forever above everything that you're afraid of, and it'll never cause you any fear again. You are already saved from this world by all that the Savior has done, and he's poured it out on you freely and fully. So be of good courage. Be strong in your faith in this world. Your Savior's already faced what you faced, and he's defeated it. It did, admittedly, hurt him. It bruised his heel. But Jesus crushed its head. And this world can't take your souls away from him anymore. Being faithful in this world, confessing Jesus, might well mean that you're going to feel some hatred coming your way. But know this, that God is in the midst of it with you. You're not going to be lost. You're not going to face it alone. And as hated as you might feel by those who reject the faith you confess, God has loved you with a love that's infinitely greater than the world's hatred. And he'll provide for you. 
Actually, Jesus' example here in Luke's gospel gives us a great direction for how we go about dealing with the hostility of the world that will come at us because of our faith. Our instinct always when we get hurt is to feel sorry for ourselves, a lot of self-pity, maybe some anger in return to lash back at them for what they did. But Jesus shows us a better way. Instead of anger, in our reading today, Jesus shows us pity. He looks to Jerusalem, the very heart of the people who have been hurting him for so long and ultimately who are going to murder him. He looks to Jerusalem and instead of cursing them for their rejection of him, he speaks words of pity and concern. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus genuinely hurts for them. Because despite their hatred of him, he loves them. And he's going to keep loving them. Even to the point of walking right into the midst of that town and laying his life down in order to reconcile them to God. Sadly, most of the people there would be lost to God because of their unbelief. But Jesus still pressed forward in love because of those few that the Holy Spirit would turn who would believe in him and leave behind their hatred and hostility. See, this is the pity that he has shown to us that has ultimately saved us. Because we were all born as enemies of God and part of this evil world, but Jesus had pity on us in our helpless state. And he loved us enough to come to us and baptize us into his name Give us his Holy Spirit. Open up heaven to us. Jesus' pity saved us. And as we endure the scorn of this world around us, it is pity that God gives us to show them. Love your enemies, Jesus says. Do good to those who hate you and persecute you. What he's talking about there is a mercy born out of pity. They are lost to God just like we once were, they're, but their souls are still precious to God, even if they don't see it. God may very well have placed us in their lives to show them the pity and compassion of the Holy Spirit like we've been shown so that they can be led out of darkness to the light of Christ's grace and be saved just like we are. So instead of anger against the world, when it turns on us, we should feel sorry for those poor souls. Because rejecting him and rejecting his word means ultimately they are rejecting eternal life. And what a terrible judgment they'll face. And how sad that they will be. And how important it is that they see the love of God reflected in us so that if possible... The Holy Spirit can lead them to his saving truth, show them their Savior, and save them. So yeah, we live in a world filled with hatred and hostility against what we confess and believe. But for our part, living in this world, we simply press forward, trusting Jesus, living without fear, having pity on those around us. We are Christ's. And the perfection he won for us in his resurrection is a perfection he has given us. We're his witnesses in this world of that perfection. And he continues to speak his words of grace and truth to us and through us. Thanks be to Jesus. Amen. Now may the grace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue by confessing our saving faith together with the Nicene Creed on page 174. Very God, very.
spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us in the conscious pilot. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. pray. Merciful Lord, give us courage in these evil days to live out our faith and confess you without fear or worry. Send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and love us that we might be sustained through this world. Grant us a heart of pity and compassion for those who are perishing, that through our humble witness they might learn of you and your gracious heart towards them. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father, heal the sick, relieve the suffering, and comfort the grieving with your promises of life. We pray especially for Verl Duncan, who's hospitalized, that you might once more sustain him in hope and give him patience in his suffering, that he might look to you for all things needful, and that you might supply him and his soul, that he can rejoice in your constant care and love, Lord, in your mercy. Dearest Jesus, overcome our pride that would keep us distant from your mercy. Renew us, body and soul, so that we might honor you with all that we are and all that we have. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed Savior, guard us against heresy and apostasy, lest we receive in vain your word of truth. Open our minds to understand your word of life. Conform our lives to your truth. Root us firmly in your grace that no false doctrine corrupt our faith and that you, by your Holy Spirit, might bring us safely into your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord God, bless our reception of Holy Communion this day that we may eat with faith and in repentance the blessed food of Christ's body and blood. By this supper, fill us with all that is needful for eternal life and strengthen our love for you and for one another. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.